In GCSE, you learned about the atom where you had a nucleus and then shells of electrons around the nucleus and the first shell could hold two and then the next one could hold eight and then you said the next one could hold eight as well. This isn't true. This is merely a way for them to teach you about electron structure and bonding through the use of these shells. But now we're slightly more advanced. Now we can talk about electrons in terms of the modern atomic theory of the structure of an atom. And the way that we can currently explain it is with energy levels. Energy levels is an incredibly interesting topic. But the key thing about energy levels is this word here, energy. Every time we're talking about energy levels, we always have to be relating it towards energy, because that determines what can bond with what, what, how the electrons are moving about. It's, it's all to do with the energy. But what are these energy levels? Well, first of all, let's, let's have a little illustration. If you were considering losing some weight, let's say you'd been to Weight Watchers, because you're a bit fat. You decide that you're going to take up running. So you don your sweatbands and take to the streets. And soon enough, you come across a road with the pavements either side. You see the lines in the middle. And on one side of the road, there is a bakery. And inside the bakery, there is a lot of delicious muffins. And they're proudly displayed in the window to get you to come and eat it. Now, as this slightly obese runner, you can either take two paths. You can either go furthest away from the bakery or closest to the bakery. Now, which of these paths is going to make you run faster? Is it the one where you walk alongside the bakery, staring into the window and drooling at the thought of eating one of the muffins, or where you stay away from it and barely notice it? Of course, it's going to be this one. The further you are away from the thing that's attracting you, the faster you're going to move and the more energy you're going to have. And we can apply this to electrons. Now, remember our nucleus, positive, made up of protons. The further away an electron is from it, the less it is going to be attracted to the nucleus and the more energy it can have from it. There's that word again, energy. So the more energy these electrons can have because there is less of a force keeping them plodding around next to this nucleus. And it's the same thing with the bakery. So when we're looking at these energy levels, they, they kind of look like these shells. And again, that's why this is only a representation because these shells are all representing energy levels. But are these energy levels discrete? Is this just a single band of really low energy and then this a band of high energy? No, it's actually kind of a gradient. There is room for a range of energies within these energy levels. And that comes in the form of something called orbitals. But first, another demonstration just to get the idea of what an orbital is. Again, well, when we look at this model, we thought that an electron was just circling around the nucleus in a circle and that it'd be quite easy to predict where it is. When we're talking about orbitals, that's not what it is at all. In fact, they're incredibly hard to predict where an electron is. That's what the whole point of an orbital is. So if we have a target on a wall made up like this, and the bullseye, and you have a tennis ball, and you throw the tennis ball at the wall, and then mark where it lands. So you mark it there, and then you pick it up and you throw it again, and mark it again. And you keep repeating this over and over again, billions and billions of times, marking the wall each time you hit it. And maybe after a few thousand, you've got a pretty rough idea of where you're aiming the ball the most. But if you keep doing it a billion amount of times, 
you will end up with so many marks that you are practically shading in the middle of your target and then getting less and less shaded further out until you have maybe a few dots where you tripped mid fall and threw them really far off target. And imagine that this tennis ball is an electron. Seeing as an electron is so tiny and so fast, we can't tell where it is at any moment in time, that's impossible. But what we can do is get an estimate for where it is. We can say, okay, it is likely to be in this position. If we were to use really intense math to work out where it could be, and we get an overall shape of what an orbital might look like. So, if we have our nucleus, and we put these little dots where the electron is at that specific moment in time, we'll end up with a shape. And these shapes are, as it turns out, what is responsible for the variation in these energies. Because when we change the shape of where an electron is likely to be, it changes the distances away from the nucleus and the energy it can have. So they worked out different shapes of these orbitals. There was one shape that looked like a sphere and they called that S and then there was another shape that looked like a figure eight and they called that, let me just draw it here, they called that the P orbital and then there was another crazy shape as well but these orbitals are called sublevels of energy because in these discrete energy levels we have these variation in energy that are caused by these sublevels of energy levels so they figured out all these different shapes and named them s p d and f orbitals you only need to know the first three and this is why it's sometimes referred to as spdf notation because you're using notation of these orbitals so if we know how the energy levels differ how many of these orbitals can fit in these discrete energy levels well we can think about it if we have a sphere we can only fit one sphere around a central point so we can only have one s orbital with the p orbital if we have our nucleus and let's just draw some axes on here so we have the x the y and the z axis so x y z this is just so that you can get a better idea of the three dimensional shapes of these orbitals because they are three dimensional so we can have a p orbital on this axis that's really shoddily drawn. Okay, we can have a p orbital on these axis, we can have a p orbital on this axis, and we can have another one on the z axis. So that's three. We can have three p orbitals in each energy level. And then with the d one, the d one is a really crazy shape. You don't need to know the specific shapes of these. I mean, it's, it's fairly easy to remember that this one's a sphere and this one's like a figure eight but the d orbital you don't need to know at all but we're going to just illustrate it here for knowledgeable purposes so let's draw our axes again and this one is going to be even worse than my shoddy drawing up here because it as i said it's a pretty crazy shape so the d orbital actually lies in the planes of the axes so we have one plane there, there's another plane that looks like this and it's width. I can't actually draw these very well at all but turns out we can have, let's rub that out, so it, it kind of looks like a clover shape, it's, yeah, a clover leaf like that around the, the centre of the atom and we can have four of these clover leaf structures around a nucleus because one lies in each of the planes but there's also another shape of a p orbital that is especially weird this one i can draw 
my artistic skills will amaze you. So, X, Y, Z, my math teacher would hate me for not labelling my axes. So, this shape of the D orbital has a donut with a figure eight in it. I told you it was weird. So, we have the donut shape that goes around the figure eight shape like that and that sits in the middle so we end up with a total of five d orbitals and as i said you don't need to know the f that's just there to let you know that it is there but so we can fit one s orbital in each energy level three p orbitals and five d orbitals but now that we know how many orbitals we can fit in our energy levels how many electrons can we fit in each of our orbitals? Well, there was a guy called Wolfgang Pauli. Kind of an awesome name, and a character on The Simpsons, bar the second name. But he came up with a principle. And he worked out that you can only have two electrons in each orbital. And he worked this out by looking at a property of electrons that later became known as spin. Now spin is a really complicated thing but we can kind of simple it down by saying an electron can have two states. It can either spin up or spin down. Now the reason why it's called spin up and spin down is a really really complicated thing and you're not going to understand anything I'm about to say but it's all about intrinsic angular momentum around something that doesn't have a surface told you you wouldn't understand it if you want to learn more about it and understand the truth then go to university and study chemistry or physics you probably do it in physics as well so an electron can either be spin up or spin down and they like to go around in pairs like this with a spin up and a spin down you'll never find two spin ups or two spin downs it's always one spin up one spin down so he said that each electron each pair of electrons can occupy one energy level so now that we know this, we can work out how many electrons can be in each of these sub-energy levels or orbitals. If we can only have one orbital which is shaped like an S and each S orbital can have two electrons, we can have a total of two electrons in the S orbitals. With P we have three P orbitals and each one can have two, so we can have six electrons Actually, let's get this out of the way and make it so e minus okay so with our d orbital we have five d orbitals each one of them has two electrons so we end up with 10 electrons so let's just make this a bit neater s p and d and then two six and ten so now we know how the energy how the electrons fit around an atom and this should all look fairly familiar i mean if we add up two and six we get eight and lo and behold back in gcse you learned that you can have eight electrons there no look two two electrons could that be an s orbital maybe as i said it is a representation of these energy levels and in the next video we'll cover about how electrons fill these energy levels and how we can write down an element in terms of its electrons and spins and stuff. But for now a little thinking exercise. How can we work out how many electrons are in each discrete energy level? I'll give you a hint and it's thinking back in GCSE when we asked the question how many shells? I will start off with this question in the next video.